welcome to The Paint Pod, where we dive into the vibrant world of art through chatting to amazing artists about their life and their work. My name is Sarah Hodgkins. I am a muralist with Charlotte Designs and now, of course, a podcaster. And my guest today is the phenomenally talented um, and, frankly, horrendously young um, Ellis O'Connor. Ellis, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you, Sarah, for having me on this. It's really, it'll be lovely to talk to you. It'd be good to have a natter. Yes. Now, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Ellis lives and works on the Isle of Skye. How lucky are you? Um, what's the weather like today? What, what have you got going on up there today? Um, there's a Scottish word to describe weather when it's like this, and it's called dreek, and it means wet, grey and drizzly. So that's what it's like right now, currently. <laughs> Is is it not like that all the time up there? Sorry. It's actually not. No, it can be so beautiful. Good. And I mean, yeah, I'm I'm very much used to this, but it's um, yeah, it's it's I'm a sure. typical dream day. I won't tell you that the sun's shining here today, then, because you probably don't want to hear that. Um, <laughs> Ellis is well. I describe you as a uh, contemporary abstract landscape artist. Would that be a fair description? How do you describe yourself? Yeah, I would say that. I mean, I, I think I'm very much inspired by the landscape and the environment, but I would say more of an abstract landscape painter yes. because it is more about what I feel as opposed to what I see exactly. Yeah. And when when I look at one of your paintings, it is all about the feeling. It's all about yeah. how it makes me feel. I I look at one and I almost can feel what the temperature is, I can, you know, work out what the weather is. There is so much that comes from, you know, your paintings, which are simplified. I'm sure that's a, a, a fair description. Mm -hmm. How do you want people to feel when they're looking at your work? I want people to feel lots of different things. Uh, I, I want people to feel challenged by what they see, so that it's not just a simple, like photo representational depiction of a landscape, but more um, lots of different different things going on, different layers, uh, land coming in and out of focus, the, the sense of energy and atmosphere. So I want people to feel that and to really look in closely to kind of find all the different layers within it. Uh, I want people to feel curious and I want people to feel small and insignificant, I guess, which seems like quite a strange thing to say, but actually because I think I think with the landscape and the environment, a lot of people in society, uh, I would say, take for granted what we have around us in the environment. And so for me, I find it important to create these really large installation based paintings that make people feel small and so people can feel the power and energy of the land. So hopefully they want to also respect it. It's like more of an emotional feeling overall. Yeah, no, I, I, that makes complete sense to me. And I'm guessing because of where you're you're based on the Isle of Skye, you perhaps yeah. see um, the effects that uh, uh, global warming is having on the environment, perhaps more than most of us sort of based down here in the in the south. Yeah, I mean, I think it's affecting everyone in, in very different ways. And um, I think having spent a lot of time also in the high Arctic and then in Iceland, I've seen it in a way that's very obvious as it is in the, the more um, extreme parts of the planet but also even um, living here and, and hearing from people that live here and that have lived here their whole lives which I haven't and seeing things like oh it's never we've never had such a, a rainy um, warm season like this before or even like last year it's so beautiful to obviously get sunshine after a very long winter um, but we had um, in from like May until June, it didn't rain for like nearly two months, which is honestly unheard of in the Scotch Highlands. Yes, it's like imagine. seriously. And, you know, to begin with, it's like, oh, this is amazing. Like, this is such a novelty. But actually, that also isn't really that feels a bit scary after a little while. Um, and yeah, just like very mild winters. And it, so, yeah, you mm. can really feel you can feel that even if you've not been in a place for that long as well mm, no absolutely yeah. and i guess it has a knock-on effect on the uh, on the flora and fauna around you which in turn has an effect on the on the communities that that, that are based there 
Yeah, definitely. And like I used to live uh, before I lived in Skye, I lived in um, the Outer Hebrides, which are the islands even further out west in Scotland. And uh, these islands are very much like low lying and uh, surrounded by the Atlantic Sea. So there's all these sea lochs like cutting into the land and you know, even things of like how much the tide was rising there and how like some people I know or knew at the time they, they would wake up and they'd have like seaweed at the bottom of their garden because the tide was coming up so high and wow. things like that. They're, it's not like it's this like abstract thing that goes on at the very no, top no, of the planet yeah. on the south. It's like, um, yeah, it's it's very obvious. So, yeah, it's um, I feel like it's all around me in different yeah, ways. I'm just great. very tuned into what's going on up here. Yeah. More so, I think, than those of us who, who I mean, I do live in a village, but, you know, we're, we're very, uh, we're not rural, really, not proper rural, not rural like you're rural. So I think <laughs> it is very different when you see the countryside on the sort of scale that you are. But you have led me very nicely. Thank you for doing that. To um, I want to start off by just talking a little bit about your background, where you came from. You yep. already mentioned. So the Outer Hebrides, is that where you were born and brought up? No, I lived out there for four years and um okay. yeah, I wasn't I wasn't born there. I was born on the east coast of Scotland in Dundee, actually. That's where oh, I grew in up. Dundee, okay. In the city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And was art a big part of your upbringing? So did you live in a in an arty house? Uh so like my mum and dad um my dad was a creative thinker so he was very much like into um writing and poetry and things like that so had a real respect for all of that and studied art history my mum also is very creative even though she would say that she isn't like she's so creative my granddad was also the head of the art department at a place in dundee called dc thompson which was the okay. which is the place that does like the beano and the dandy you know like all the yeah, yeah. i don't know if you've heard of them but they're like quite yeah. iconic you know so he i think having grown up when when i did and being younger and like always been absolutely obsessed with art and then um, it was always a thing that was never like oh like that's just a hobby or oh like what are you going to do if you go to art school like it was always like i remember being maybe about 18 and being in high school and just saying to my mum and dad like i have to go to art school that's what i have to do and they were only supportive and only like well yeah as long as you're happy like that's all that matters so it was never a thing that was like, what are you going to do with an art degree? How are you going to make money from that? You know, which is so sad when people, when I still hear of people my age that all the time, that, all the time. that is a thing that happens to them, you know? And so uh, I'm really grateful for that. But also I've had a lot of conversations with my mum recently about like what I was like when I was really young. And like she said that she would like Go come on. into our room yeah, yeah, when I was like maybe three or four and like full on hyper focusing drawing and painting, even at that age. So I wow. think it's always something I've needed to do for my probably for my mental health, but also just to have that outlet. It's like an instinctual need to create. So I'm grateful that I can do it. <laughs> yeah. So apart from your parents, who who was those early influencers that helped you to sort of realize that art was what you wanted to do was it a teacher was it somebody else I don't know yeah like I I did if I'm honest like I did find art in high school quite boring because it is so like it's so restrictive and you have to do like do you know what I mean you have to do all that stuff to yes. like tick boxes and all that and oh, it's not very I creative I find it yeah when I think back I'm like god it was so boring especially with the style that I know I have now and that was yes. in me even at that age um but <laughs> my art teachers were supportive like there was a couple of them that were really good and so yes. there was that encouragement of of I, no one from my high school had really gone to art school in yes. such a long time it just wasn't a thing that was um such a known thing more people would mm. go into like maths or English or more other subjects like that so um, I think back and I, I think they were supportive in that way which was good and then when I was in art school I just had really fantastic tutors that were like go for it you know they were really supportive right. and encouraging so uh, that was really important for me at that time. So is that where your style started to um, emerge for want of a better word? when you got to art school because you went to Jordanston College of Art is that right yeah yeah Duncan of Jordanston so it's the art school in Dundee part of Dundee University and I'm biased but I think it's very good <laughs> um yeah uh, I have to say you know it's proof that it is <laughs> the fact you're sitting here thanks 
<laughs> Thanks, sir. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think when I was in art school, so in first year, because I was only 18 when I went to art school, I think that is so young to know exactly what you want to do with an art. Like it's such yeah. a, you know, to, to for me, I didn't want to box myself in at such a young age. So uh, there's the first year of art schools called the general foundation year where I just tried everything. And you just, you're encouraged to do everything, all the different modules. So that's like animation, illustration, graphic design, all those things that I realized I don't like them because you need to be patient <laughs> and clean and detailed and I'm not those things. And so it was good to get all that out of my system though. And then um, in second year, I specialized in fine art, but even at that art school, it was so open with like, actually, uh, even it was fine art, you were still very much encouraged to try lots of different things within fine art. It wasn't like you are now going to do painting for yeah. three years. It was like, I could do painting or I could do printmaking and combine them all together because they all inform one another anyway. Um, Absolutely. And then, yeah, and so I realized that actually when I've always been drawn to the highlands, I've always been drawn to being outside and hiking up mountains or camping. And I loved that when I was young, but then when I was in art school, I think I'd, beginning of it, I'd stopped doing all of that stuff and then started going right. on road trips again around the highlands in like second year when I was like 20 um, yeah. and realized like I love all of this and so I want to make my work about all of this because it's like bringing both passions and like intense um, loves together basically. And I think that makes perfect sense. I, I did a very similar thing when I went to art school. I, yeah. I, I did a, a course that enabled me to try lots and lots of different things yeah. and, and I think you're absolutely right. I think almost understanding what you don't want to do is almost as important yeah. as understanding what you do want to do and absolutely um, yeah I, I I was going to ask I was going to ask you you know who who is your sort of most influential influential artist or what inspires you the most but I'm going to say it's probably the landscape I mean are there artists that inspire you or is it very much you are yeah. inspired yeah. by what's around you I think it's so good to be open to inspirations and not just be like I'm only inspired by painters like I have so many different right. inspirations and yeah absolutely like I'm so drawn to the environment and all the different ways in which that change and fluctuates all the time but I've I'm also even when I was in art school was really drawn to certain artists who I still really love for inspiration and I remember going to an Anselm Kiefer show in London when I was like 19 and I was obsessed with his work. I still am, just because of the scale <laughs> and the the drama and like, God, they're so dark, some of them, you know, but I love it. I love feeling that emotion from that work because it makes you feel something. And, you know, it's also lovely to, for me, like to look at an artist who's really gone to the depths and is creating work about a real dark human experience, but you can feel it like you can feel that energy from the yes. work so i've always i've always loved his work and um also another artist in scotland who's called francis walker who's in her 90s now and she's an amazing oh, wow. artist and um if you've her. not heard of her i think you'd probably love right. her work she does a lot of work about the environment and um like these huge prints and paintings and she lives in aberdeen now i think but she's i think she's still creating she's amazing Brilliant. I, I love that. There's a great um, there's a great photograph of a lady. I think she's in her late eight, late 80s or 90s muraling yeah. the outside of her house. Oh, and wow. everyone always sends me this picture and says, that's going to be you. That'll be you. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be you. There's something inspiring about someone who feels so passionate about what they do that age is not a barrier. Yeah. They just carry on doing it's it. It's not. So, do you not true. think it's... Do you not think as well, though, like when, when people say, to, maybe I don't know if you ever get this, but like sometimes people have said to me like, oh, so like, you know what? I mean, I'm only I'm only 32. I'm like, this is so young for people to say this. But like, no, that's no, like, oh, child, will, you, child. will you retire? And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, no. if you're an artist, you're never just going to retire from this, you know? No. No, my, my husband has awesome. accepted this. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. I was going to say that. I was like, yeah, because like for what you do as well, like it's, that's probably for you, it's that like instinctual need to create. It's not something you just go, right, I'll finish now. No, it, it doesn't work like that, does it? No, not at all. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about 
the physical process of how you create your pieces of work. So yeah. I know you do work uh, on plain air, uh, which I find absolutely incredible in the Scottish weather. Um, <laughs> you must have to yeah. weigh your easel down with sandbags and things <laughs> like that so it doesn't blow away. Um, but what yeah. is the creative process? How do you how do you start? In fact, actually, I'm going to I'm going to take a step back. Yeah. When you wake up in the morning, um, do you have a plan? Are you someone who plans what you're going to paint, or are you somebody for whom you just have an idea and suddenly it just you just have to do it? How does it work? Yeah, I am Sarah. I am. That's a good question. I am very um, the opposite of a planner in general in life you know, I, um, I would have guessed that <laughs> yeah I am actually quite chaotic in how I go about things and um very expressive and like when when paintings come out of me it just all comes out and it's like there's yeah. nothing planned about it it's just like this thing of it has to happen so um I think though I'm learning about myself like I'm probably someone that does need a bit of a routine but when I do have a routine I rebel against it so do you know what I mean it's like I, I think exactly I benefit yeah, I think I'd benefit from having a bit of a routine. So I try and do certain things, but I will also rebel against it because I'm like, oh, I just, that doesn't, that doesn't fit. Think of it as a loose structure rather than a routine, a loose structure, yeah. just to sort of yeah, keep loose you. Yeah, 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 much better than a routine, which, me? yeah, not so, like yeah. Me. I don't do so, rules of any kind. No, I just I just can't deal with any of it. I like just go against all of it. I always have done. Um, <laughs> I think um, I think so. When you're asking about the, the if I've got a plan or anything, what I'm realizing about myself is that when I paint, I will go into like a it could be for a, a few weeks, and it will be like a full hyper focus for a few weeks of creating so much work because I'm in that flow mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. and then it'll all come out of me. It's like I have so much going on in my head, and I have so many ideas, so it'll all come out in this like big cathartic release on the canvas. <laughs> but then, if, and then once I'm done, I'm like, I'm done. I can't paint for a month or two. And and I'm okay with that. Like I'm absolutely embracing that now and realizing that that's how I work and that's okay. Like I used to try and force myself a few years ago when art, my art took off and all of that. I used to think, oh, I need to paint every day. I need to work every day. but being an artist and being an artist in this world and the creative process is whatever you make it. Like, I don't need to create every day. I can paint, mm -hmm. if it feels right for me, I can paint consistently for a few weeks and get so much work done. And then for two months, I can go traveling around, build up inspiration, have my sketchbook, um, play music. Like that's all part of the creative process. And I, I think I'm so glad that done, yeah. I think it, someone once said to me, you can't pour tea from an empty teapot. Absolutely. And I think that's actually quite a good analogy that yeah. while the teapot is full, while we're feeling um, enthused by what is going on creatively, we yeah. can just yeah. pump it out. But then we get to the end. It's like I've got nothing left. There's, there's yeah. nothing left to do. And yeah. so, you know, for you particularly, it's going out. It's going into the countryside. It's just absorbing yeah. getting more of that inspiration in so that the art can come out. I mean, it, it, it makes perfect sense when you say it like that. It's like the water cycle. Absolutely. And I, yeah, it so is, because I think when I was younger, I probably internalised a bit of that capitalism of, like, I have to paint every day, I have to work every day. And I'm like, yeah, but being productive and painting every day, if it comes naturally and that's authentic, then that's great. But if I force it, then it's terrible. It's not going to be authentic. And I don't want to paint from a place of obligation. I want to paint from a place of actually right. inspiration and peace and, and want. And um, it's also realizing as well of that thing of, you were saying about um, you can't pour from an empty cup. And it's, for me, I feel that analogy of realizing that I, it's uh, taking in. So it's like that breath in of all the inspiration, mm -hmm. the workshops, the, sketchbook work and then the breath out is all of the painting but both are just as valid and authentic as one another and Absolutely. I really used to internalize feeling like oh I've not painted for a few weeks oh I feel terrible and I'm like that's bullshit like sorry to swear. <laughs> but no, no, it's, it's 
we're meant it's it, we're, it's meant to be this balance of having the in and the out and and we need both to inform one another and um yeah for me I've, I'm I'm so grateful that I've learned that um at this stage in my career because then I'm not hard on myself anymore and it does take a long time to get to that point because you're absolutely right you know you're a successful artist you're 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 making money from your art so there's this constant yeah. I need to one you know I feel like I need to be on the treadmill and making all the yeah. time and of course you absolutely yeah. don't because our, no. our work takes more of our being than I don't know serving yeah. burgers in McDonald's just to pick a job off the top of my head it, yeah. it's a different yeah. kind of process and you yeah, can't be expected process. To do so. yeah and it's not a job that you, um, that for me, like there's other jobs that are just as valid. All jobs, you know, all jobs are valid, whatever people do. But it's not a job that I can finish working in an office and then come home and I'm like, I'm not going to think about that for a few days. It's like being an artist is being an artist in the world. Right. It's a different thing. It's, yeah, I'm grateful that I get to do what I love as a job, but also I cannot switch off from it because I'm no. always thinking about things. And that in itself is a superpower, but also that can also be consuming as well. Absolutely. I'm one of these sad human beings that takes my sketchbook on holiday when I go and I sit on the lounges and literally <laughs> draw away because I just, I don't know, sad, but yeah. true. Yeah, um, but it's not sad. It's That's what you want. And that's great. <laughs> No, and I enjoy it. And it's actually a really nice way of switching off because I'm I'm doing something different from my normal art job. I'm just yeah. sketching people or just palm trees or boats on yeah. the sea. Yeah. Um, so it, it is different. And often I will use that work as inspiration for, you know, maybe a mural project that I know I've got coming up. So yeah. those things feed each other to it to a certain Absolutely. extent. Absolutely. Yeah. So you work on quite a big scale generally um mm -hmm. and I've seen you I've seen the Instagram reels I've seen you with your canvas and your brushes um how long yeah. does it take you to do one of your your bigger canvases because some of your canvases are quite big uh, yeah some of them are quite big uh very much just depends on if I'm happy with it or not so oh. uh, because they're oils I'll tend to build them up maybe over like three or four layers so okay. if I'm if I'm really happy with the work, then that can maybe be like a month because with the drying times of and course, things yeah. like that. Um, or if I'm not happy with it, you know, it can it could take a bit longer because I just want to paint over it again. Um, but yeah, probably on average, like the the layers involved and the time it's taken and yeah, the drying time probably about a month. You know, okay. but the actual painting part itself, like. That's probably a few hours, really, but the actual evolving of, of it all together would be that period of time. And do you, I mean, obviously, apart from the plein air, do you, do you create sketches? Do you have, I mean, you've mentioned a sketchbook already, do you have sort of, I don't know, reference drawings or reference photographs that you're using in your studio? Because I'm certainly one of these people that I will take lots of reference pictures um, and I yeah. will look at them and I will study them. And then I will paint without looking at them. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it's interesting how, yeah, we all have such different processes. Um, I think for me, I realise I actually have no images in my studio. I have no photographs at all. And I think it's because I realise that if I try and paint and I look at an image and I try and kind of paint that, I, I it puts me out of the the, the, the letting go, the, pro, the, the mm. artist, the full state, Great. because I noticed in myself, and I have noticed that in the past, that if I, when I'm, when I'm creating and when I'm faced with a large canvas and I have no idea what's going to, what's going to appear on it, then if I look at an image, I have that image in my head and then when I start creating marks and I surrender to the process and it doesn't look like the image in my head, then it puts a block on that flow state. So if I try and go into the process without, without having any image in my head and just allow the tools and the materials and the element of spontaneity as well, and allow the image to come from that as opposed to starting off with it in my head, that's that's how I access the flow state much gotcha. more um, because it doesn't put a block because I can get quite hard on myself. I'm like, oh, it doesn't look like that image. And I'm like, no, I'd rather just not have an image there. <laughs> but do you not think that that comes to an extent from the way that art is taught? 
yeah. in schools and in colleges. We're all taught to believe that a painting should look like the real thing that we're painting yeah. uh, from a very early age. And yeah. I have heard teachers say to children, oh, well, that's that's not right. That doesn't look like that. And you just want to go, no. <laughs> Absolutely, because what does that even mean anyway? There's no right or wrong. No. It's a freedom of expression. Oh, and it's crazy, isn't it? And I, I do notice that. Like, I realise that if we all painted exactly the same thing of what we've seen, then what's the point in that? Like, I could take a photograph instead. And that's that's absolutely not the discount artists who do paintings in a very photo representational way. Like, that is such a skill and a master. And I have so much respect for artists like that because that's so amazing. And it's that's their response to it. And that's amazing. But personally, for myself, I cannot do that. I cannot paint in that no. way. And I need no, to... So I need to I need it to be my response in a way that's more abstract and more about my emotions and feelings. Um, because yeah, if we all if we all just painted the exact same thing, then what is what is the point in art? Like that's it'd be all the same, it'd be so boring. And um yeah, it's such a sad thing that then follows people around their whole lives because then they think, yep. I'm not an artist, because they don't they can't paint exactly what they see. And it really does like have a massive impact on people's self-esteem. Like it's it's wild, isn't it? Couldn't agree more. It's interesting. Uh, as part of my practice, I do workshops. Um, I yeah. do workshops for kids, but I also do workshops for adults as, in, a, in a sort of corporate setting. And it's really interesting yeah. for me how you can say to a group of kids, we're going to we're going to paint today. And they'll go, yes. Mm -hmm. And you say to a group of adults, we're going to paint today. And they'll just go, I can't paint. I can't paint. Yeah. They're, they're like, oh, I can't do it. I can't even paint a stick, man. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, oh, God, if I had a pound for the number of times I've heard that. Absolutely. And it's interesting that something happens between the age of about, I don't know, maybe nine, ten. Yeah. Yeah. And when they become adults, that takes that out of them. And it can only be the education process. It can only be yeah. Yeah. constantly being told that it's not right. It doesn't look right. And that yeah. for me is 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 the difference. And it drives me crazy. But it if we get so onto that, sad. we'll never get off it. Yeah, I know. It's so sad. And it makes people so hard on themselves. And they're like, yeah. and then they think of this thing as something they never can do. And I'm like, but that's, there's no right or wrong with art. And that's so difficult to share that with people and say, there's no right or wrong. That's not how it is. But it's just because that conditioning when they're young is just so deeply ingrained. Um, and I think for me, I'm grateful that art school uh, dismantled all of that out of me. <laughs> I think that's what it yes. is. Good. Yeah, and, and brilliant. I mean, that's that's so good. When it comes yeah. to feedback on your work, um, mm -hmm. are you your own critic or do you have people that you turn to for feedback? And how do you how do you incorporate that feedback into your work? Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I feel like I don't get that very often. Um, I'm grateful to have really good friends that are also artists and we can talk about our work and um because I'm always wanting to to get out of my comfort zone and keep growing and developing. I don't want to just be someone who just churns things out. I, or I think, oh, this one does well. I'm going to just do this now. It's like, I, I don't want that. That feels very, very claustrophobic and stifling to me. So I do ask my friends, like, oh, I'm going to try this out or feedback in that way. But I think I, think I do validate myself the majority of the time um and that comes down to this phrase that i heard actually from a therapist a while ago and she'd said about how there's this term called the internal locus of evaluation and that basically means that if you're happy with something bring it back to okay i'm happy with it that's all yes. that matters because i've realized that social media the world in general is so noisy if i'm sharing an art a piece of art out there and someone, I don't know, on Instagram, for example, someone could say, oh, I really love that. You should definitely do more in that color. Oh, I really love that one. You should do more and start outsourcing all that validation. Then what am I doing it for? Because actually that's that's a bottomless pit. Like that does not actually go anywhere. It's wonderful when my art, when people resonate with my art, of mm. course. And I'm grateful when people um, want to purchase my work and they really enjoy it. However, I'm painting for myself. That's it. Mm. Like I'm not doing it for other people. And I think as soon as you start outsourcing all of that and going, oh, I'm going to paint because people really love this palette or people love that. I'm like, well, what's the point in me being an artist then? Because 
that's not authentic and people can tell people can tell it's not authentic I think um and for me that's honestly been the biggest thing if I've finished the painting I'm like I'm really happy with that if I get a critique or a praise on it it's basically the same thing because it doesn't matter and yeah, that no, might no, seem quite you know that that might seem quite cutthroat saying that because of course it's so wonderful to get praise and I'm always grateful for praise and that's that's a part of sharing my that's work online right. great. but it doesn't it doesn't change the way the work makes me feel so who buys your work who are your customers um it's very varied actually like I'm I'm really grateful that uh my a lot of my work sells uh online um to different people around the world and it, it really blows my mind sometimes i'm like oh like i'm just sending a painting to new zealand or i'm sending a painting to canada and i've got quite a lot of american clients which is wonderful okay, and, and really i think it's from i think it's from instagram um really like instagram's been a big player in that over the years and then building up that relationship through my newsletter and things but in terms of other uh, buyers and clients it's through galleries that i'll show with here in scotland and uh yeah it's wonderful when it's someone who's maybe bought a painting like six years ago when my, when my work was very different and then they want to buy something else you know down the line and uh yeah it's it's very varied i, I can't really say if it's like a type of demographic or it's more of a certain gender it's really not like it's it's very much like worldwide with the power of social media and then more like Scottish based people down in England, all that it's, it's very much um, circumstantial on where the work is shown as well. And you've probably already answered this question, but you're not painting for your clients. You're not painting for your customer base. It is very much painting yeah. for you. You don't have your customer yeah. in the back of your mind and think, oh, they liked that painting. I wonder if they'll like this. No, don't think like no, that. No, I don't, because then what's the point in me doing it? You know, like No, no, no. That's it's interesting. You know, and yeah, it's such a good it's such a good question, isn't it, to talk about this because I feel like I, I don't want I don't want to start doing a painting with it in my head going, Oh, this will do well because I think this person might like it. It's like but that's that's not then um engaging my inner expression at all that's not do, that's not authentic I'm doing it to please someone else and I'm actively trying not to be a people pleaser anymore mm, because it's actually not helpful <laughs> you know it's like we're all I just really want to dismantle that and continue to dismantle being a people pleaser because it absolutely gets you nowhere so it's like that thing that I'm I'm realizing that um if I if I am creating a new work or a painting whatever that I'm I'm really going into it thinking Okay, I'm just going to let go and not have in my head this might be good for this exhibition or this might be good for this show. Like I'm really just trying to be like, I'm just going to play and I'm going to surrender to the materials and see what comes out. And it's but it's really hard because there's always deadlines for things. How how do you run the commercial side of your business? Do you have someone to do that for you, or is it something that you're still doing yourself? Yeah, I do. Every, I actually do everything on my own because I think I'm a bit of a control freak sometimes, to be honest. <laughs> With, you and I are peas in a pod. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny, isn't it? I think a lot of artists are, though, to be honest. <laughs> um, I do think, yeah, I do most of it. I do the majority of it on my I have one of my friends who, like, helps me out with, like, website things. If it's, like, a, like set, putting things on my website, like, she'll do a lot of that because she's just so good, of, good at those things and I really don't have a head for that. Um, and then if I've got like if it's like near Christmas and I've got a lot of like commercial orders going out or like orders for that time of year where it gets really busy um, I'll have someone to help me like package up work and, and all of that but in general it's me doing all the plate spinning which depending on the time of year it feels very manageable and then other times I'm like oh my goodness I this is a lot to keep up with sometimes um yeah, yeah but to answer your question mainly me yeah Good, good. No, that's that's good to hear. And I think, you know, I'm hoping that we will get uh, lots of other artists listen to this. And I think sometimes it's important to realise that there's nothing wrong with keeping control yourself. I think no. I talk to to emerging artists who are like, oh, you know, I need to get an agent. I need to get a gallery. I need to get all this. And it's yeah. like, actually, yeah. you don't need it. Yes. If you want to go down that route. Then yeah, if you absolutely. want to. Yeah. But I think there's nothing wrong with keeping it 
um, and I'm like you, I'm a control freak. <laughs> I like to know what's going on. And there's a lot to be said yeah. for that, I think. Um, I mean, what I would say is, so sorry to interrupt you, Sarah, I do have an accountant because numbers, yeah, stereotypically God, yes, being an absolutely. artist, I can't do any of that stuff. I don't know, no, I don't know no. what I would have done if I didn't have an accountant. No, no. Well, I, I wouldn't have been in business 19 years if I didn't have an accountant, I can tell you that yeah, right that's, now. You need someone to keep you in check with all that stuff. <laughs> Just never have happened because I'm absolutely yeah. useless. Uh, anything to do with mileage, numbers, anything Me like too. that. Me no, too. Don't, don't get involved. Yeah. Don't get involved. It's too boring as well. I'm like, I can't, I'm not going to do this. I rebel against no, it. I'd rather poke forks in my eyes. I really <laughs> yeah, <would>. me too. <laughs> Um, talk to me a little bit about pricing as well. This is something, again, that I get a lot of people uh, come to me about. How how do you decide what you're going to charge for one of your paintings? That's honestly probably one of the most difficult things. Yeah, is. that is. Which is why I'm such, asking, it is a, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question to ask because I think, I think back to art school and, like, there really wasn't a lot of chat about that at all. And no, it's there really isn't. difficult. Um, I'm grateful that the gal there's a few galleries in Scotland that represent my work and that show my work and yes, they're really understand. brilliant and so so supportive and they they absolutely don't mind that I still sell my work online and my own collections like they're really supportive and they gave me advice on I had an exhibition with one of them in particular last spring and they gave me advice on the, the sort of pricing point mm -hmm. of what my paintings should be because there's a range of sizes and then I have it just set at that um, across the board. And that feels like, you know, obviously things have gone up since I started about eight years ago or started self being self-employed. Those those paintings have gone up. But even that sometimes I'm like, how do you know when your paintings go up in price? Like, how do you know? Like, I, I don't I don't know how that works. Like, does it take 20 years, 10 years? I have no idea. But um. <laughs> I just am grateful that they gave me advice on what the kind of size, where I was in my career, what they thought would work with their clients. And they've managed to sell a lot of bigger ones for me. So, um, yeah, maybe that's not very helpful because it's things I've actively got help with from a gallery because it's really difficult. But I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think galleries can help you to perhaps just guide you and, and sort yeah. of give you an yeah. idea of, of what's available. I have a friend who who owns a gallery and I often go in there and I look at some of the pieces she has and I'm going, yeah. I'm undercharging, I'm undercharging. But yeah. I, it's so subjective. I think provided as an artist, you are happy, you are being remunerated correctly for yeah. what you're doing and you are happy with the lifestyle that that remuneration gives you, then I think yeah. that's fine. It is. And I think that's the thing as well is remembering, always bringing it back to the thought of like, there is no blueprint on being an artist. No. Like there is no set way of being. So if it works for you, then that's all that matters. So for me, I like the balance of selling a lot of my work online, having my own independent um, relationships with clients and having a newsletter, which has been really good just to have that engagement over the years because then it means I could be based in Sky and it's easy to ship my work wherever. Mm. So then I can have that way as an income stream, which has been brilliant. But then also I really like selling with certain galleries that I get on really well with and that they're maybe based in more parts of Scotland or further afield that are in a city that engages people that have maybe never heard of my work before because they've maybe never visited Sky or they've not saw my work yeah. online. So, but there is no blueprint. And I think it's, I think that's why it's, important for artists especially when they're starting out is to realize that there is absolutely no point comparing yourself to other artists because we need art more than ever in this world like we need art all the everywhere right now absolutely. but also there's no everyone's in their own lane and just because someone's got an exhibition in a certain place and that person hasn't yet that doesn't say anything about their worth as an artist because there's more there's space for all of that there's space for all of them right, and right. i think it's so important to learn that and also to not think of other artists as competition like because we're not like we un we all have a very similar experience in this world and um it's not competition like that's such a scarce mentality like we need art you know more than ever and yeah, I think it's just good to remember that all the time
Now, I want to um, touch on, I noticed you've just done a residency in Wales. And then when yeah. I went onto your website to do uh, research for this podcast, I realised you've actually done quite a few residencies, haven't you? I have. I, I do quite, I do like a residency, Sarah. Yeah, I do. So what attracts you to a residency? And then you can talk to me a little bit about the one in Wales and, and, and how you found it. I think what attracts me to a residency is that I've always, since I've been very young, I've been very free spirited and have intense wanderlust. And I, I, abs I think I'm absolutely in my element when I go somewhere that I've never been before, get out of my comfort zone, build up new inspiration and really immerse myself in a new place. So a residency is really good for, for me and the, the person in myself who loves traveling because I can have that double whammy of going somewhere new but also it feeds into my art um, so that's why I love a residency and the reason why I applied for the Wales one is because I never really knew Wales that well and I just thought for January, February, I find quite a difficult time of year. Like I find January quite hard and oh, I can feel I can feel quite sluggish and tired. But also it's when it's a good time for me to paint because it's dark. It's I, I want to paint more in the winter. So it was good for me just to go and have a couple of weeks there and fully immerse myself in a new environment where I'd never been before. Wales is so beautiful. Yes, beautiful. The couple that run the residency were so supportive and also at the same time I had no distractions like I could fully just get into the flow state being there and uh, that was that was really good for me because I've made so much work whereas when I'm in Sky I can make work here but I live here so there's other things going on I've been doing like renovations to the cottage all these different mm. things so it's harder to find that. a <laughs> long yeah, it's so hard to find like long, unlimited periods of time to just fully paint. And so that was that was why I went, basically. I've seen some of the um, the work that you've posted on Instagram uh, as a result of this residency. And I've noticed a shift in colour palette. There's a there's a little shift in colours, I noticed. Yeah. What's going on there? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I'm really loving them um, and the direction. I'm realising that in myself that... I don't have any control over what comes out and it's really very instinctual what what happens if what kind of palette I pick up how my colors change how that development goes but I'm very much letting go and surrendering to that because I want to because mm -hmm. um I just want to share quickly about something that really made me think wow that's so interesting like a few years ago this person yeah, came to see my work at a show and my work was very different to how it was when I started out eight years ago or nine years ago when I left art school and he said to me he went well your work's changed quite a lot I'm not really sure if I like it anymore it's very different and I said to him but is it not meant to be because I I just don't have any filter and I was like I just of course it's meant to be different and I said to him I said and it was an interesting conversation I said I'm I think I was like, this has been five years since I've painted these works. I'm very different. I've grown a lot in five years. So of course, my art's going to reflect that. Because if it doesn't, that's actually quite an unhealthy sign if my art doesn't mm. evolve and develop and grow as I do. Absolutely. That's stunted then. And so when new colours arise and new palettes arise and the, there's development in my practice, like I'm just fully like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm, I'm enjoying it because it shows that I'm constantly growing and it's so important and do you find that the residences feed that to a certain extent you're suddenly surrounded by different countryside different weather different colors so do you find yeah. that those residences help to feed that sort of development that change Oh yeah, I definitely think so. And again, it's not even necessarily like, because Wales felt quite similar to here in Sky, like especially where I was, I was like in Snowdonia National Park. So it did feel quite similar. But um, again, it's not necessarily about exactly what I'm seeing from the residency window, what comes out on the painting. It's just what, what I'm processing in my mind, like thousands of thousands of scenes, thousands of memories are coming out and then they're being processed in my head to then come out onto the canvas. So I think it just allows me a residency allows me the space to be able to really fully go into that that flow state into that hyper focus state and um play and and not have this like set deadline of like oh right I need to do this I've got I've got this going on but it just allows me the, the space to um really uh, immerse myself in my practice and mm. and then that's when all the surprises come out 
Now, you've just mentioned it, and I wanted to come back to it anyway, so you've anticipated me well yet again. No conversation uh, with Ellis O'Connor would be complete without a mention of your gorgeous little cottage, uh, which um, I also follow on Instagram. Um, a home that you've been renovating, what, for a year or so? I don't know how long you've been Yeah, there. so I, I bought it. Um, it's my first home, so I bought it. I got the keys um, about a year and a half ago now. It was like two oh, summers ago. Okay. Yeah. So... As an artist, and I speak as a, a I'm an ex interior designer, so I'm I'm really awful. Um, do you find being an artist comes out in the way that you are decorating your home? Is that influenced? Yeah, absolutely. I've 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 so enjoyed it. Like the the cot the cottage itself had, was in very good condition when I bought it, so I was really grateful for that. Like it's very old, but it's got a lot of character, and it, but it'd been modernised quite a bit. But just the decor and all of that was not my vibe at all. And so it's been that process of um, painting it in a way and and um, renovating it and decorating it in a way that fits with my style and aesthetic because I didn't know what that was even when I got it because I'd never been able to decorate or renovate a house before and um, so uh, that's been a really cool process and last year I definitely noticed that I didn't paint as much because I was so enjoying this as a creative project in itself mm -hmm. um, painting and um, just having the space to be able to um, yeah engage this part of my brain which is so creative um, but also okay. one, of my, one of my best friends is an interior designer so she actually mm -hmm. helped me at the beginning create a palette for what I really loved, which has been so helpful. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like you've really enjoyed the process. Um, so now the is the cottage finished? I mean, I suppose these things are never finished, are they? There's always something to do yeah, I mean, with. Yeah, I mean, the room that I'm in currently is just the room that is like my office, painted storage, random. Gotcha. There's always a room like that in any house, so I'm like, that's fine. <laughs> um, but in general yeah most of it like all the kind of more like insulation new floorboards all that kind of stuff's been done wow. and then all the rooms have been yeah all the rooms have been painted and they all that feels very there's always things that need done like i feel like oh, taking God, on a always. property yes. like this there's always going to be a project but that's okay that's what i like yeah no absolutely so that's going to free up lots more time for you to paint of course yeah so what's what's coming up for, for ellis o'connor this year what should we be looking out for um so I've got a few different shows, which is which is great um, that I've scheduled in for the year. So I've got a show currently on in the Strathairn Gallery in Creef, and Fantastic. then I've got a show coming up in Aberfeldy at the Watermill Gallery, and then over the summer, um, well, I've got an exhibition here in Sky in April and May, and I, I mean I've got all those things listed on my website if, anyway. If anyone wanted to have a look at what I was up to, but in terms of like bigger plans, like if I'm honest, like I feel like a real call to like basically be here on the west coast, like from right. like April till September because it's so beautiful and it's honestly the best yes. place to be. And there's so much going on here, and just being outside. So I really feel like I actually don't want to paint as much over the summer because I just want to be outside. And I'm grateful that I can have that balance of. Uh, painting so much in the winter or the darker seasons and then when the lighter seasons come around I can just be outside and travel around I've also got a little camper van so I just want to spend more time on adventures as well but you can paint outside you yeah that's, I know <laughs> that's wait. the thing but I think it's not about not painting outside I think it's I just don't feel as inspired to paint in the summer because the light quality is different it's not as dramatic yes. it's I'm I much prefer the drama and the more darker stormier scenes so yeah. when the summer comes around and it's light you know and it's more of these like flat blue skies it doesn't inspire me as much interesting yeah no no, no. I mean that yeah. makes perfect sense um yeah okay I've I have asked about a third of the questions that uh, I had <laughs> for you oh today. <laughs> no, it's great. It's fantastic. It's been really good. And I've loved the way that we've, we've, we've gone off on tangents. And, and that's kind I of the I do go off of on this. tangents. That's what I was going to say at the beginning. I do. But that's great. That's fantastic. And I think there's lots there for people to, to dig into. Anybody who wants to look further at your work, um, ellisoconnor.com is the place to go. Um, yeah. And you are very active on Instagram, um, at Ellis O'Connor. Go and have a look at on Instagram and um, drink in Ellis's wonderful work. 
Um, I've not visited Sky, but I tell you what, you make me want to go. You really do. And I will. Thank you. I'm saying I yeah. will. I will come mm-hmm. and visit. Huge thanks to Ellis O'Connor for being a fabulous guest today. And also to you for listening to The Paint Pod. Please do like, subscribe, tell your friends, all of those things. It does make a massive difference. And until our next wander through our audio gallery of inspiration, thank you and goodbye.